um, operational weather forecasting and, and science. Um, most of it was in the weather service. Uh, he, he, after graduating from San Jose uh, State um, in the late 80s, he did a stint with AccuWeather, but he's held a number of positions as a science operations officer in most regions of the country, I see. Um, he's done a stint at the Storm Prediction Center uh, he was the uh, Scientific Services Division Chief in the Central Region in Kansas City. And most recently, Jeff and I were colleagues in the Weather Service Office of Science and Technology Integration. Um, so the, the impetus for inviting Jeff to speak actually was some conversations we had with our, our NOAA colleagues at the National Water Center uh, in Tuscaloosa um, and an interest in, in making use of the national blend. Uh, and it just made sense to get um, Jeff to talk about sort of the recent advances. I've heard from many colleagues that NBM is making great strides. Um, so Jeff is gonna talk about using national blend of models for probabilistic hydrometeorological applications. Um, there's lots and lots of applications, but we sort of, given the sort of the origin of this, we asked Jeff to kind of focus more on the hydrometeorological end of things. So uh, with that, uh, Jeff. Oh, and one last uh, logistical point. So I think Jeff would, uh, wouldn't mind just taking questions as they come along. So I think the easiest way to handle questions is just post them in the chat and we'll try to flag um, Jeff down and, and just deal with them as they come up. And if it gets to be too onerous, maybe I'll interject and see how it goes. But um, so please just post questions in the chat window and we'll keep an eye on that. So thank you, Jeff. Go ahead. Well, I I really appreciate that introduction, Tim. Uh, you'll find that I'm relatively informal. I'm, you know, I it's it's an honor to give a you know, a webinar and a, a to a group of scientists. So you probably at times see me more as a forecaster than a scientist. And that's that's really, you know, that, that I'll just put that note uh, in advance. Some of the things I, the way I look at life is how does the end user likely to use this? Um, but it, you know, the blend is a huge application. It was initially designed uh, to reduce the amount of grid editing that forecasters in the field would need to do to try to get a more seamless product. Uh, any of you who have looked at the an NDFD, our official weather service forecast outside of say a county warning area, a local office, you'll see seams. There's been less and less over the years, but you'll still see differences that are non-meteorological. Uh, I think one of the high-ranking weather service folks called it uh, first-order discontinuities, <laughs> which I think is a good way to put it. So what we'll do today, I have a couple, I have some materials attached to the Google Calendar invite for those that want to take deeper dives. Um, there's also links to uh, journal articles, but I just want to, you know, tr in a short period of time, trying to cover what we do in the blend is difficult. So we'll try to highlight a few things. Um, we have a couple of experts on quantile mapping and dressing on the call, Tom Hamill and Michael Shirer, who, you know, hopefully won't cringe too much as I gloss over the extremely complex things that they do. But one thing you'll note is just in, in, in the same kind of ways that the UFS is trying to develop a community model, uh, we think we can gradually get to the point with the blend that it's more of a community post-processing system. So uh, work from Tom and Michael through cooperative institutes and OAR, what was PSD and PSL made it through the valley of death and are in operations. And I think that more and more of that can happen with time. So keep that in mind. So we'll give some verification. I'll look, I, 
I went, I did most of this presentation today because I wanted to pick out examples from forecast today uh, rather than just using something can't. So I don't even know how some of these things are going to verify yet. So we'll find out. So for those that want to take a deeper dive, um, we've got Hamill et al. from Monthly Weather Review that covers the, the initial quantile mapping and dressing work. There are other papers which Eric Engel, our main quantile mapping and dressing uh, QPF developer plan on using down the line. So there's another article that I probably should have put on here about ranked histograms. That uh, That is something we'll cover briefly. We have a, a, a basic journal article in the uh, uh, NWA Journal of Operational Meteorology and links to these. Uh, so the blend is a what I would call a kitchen sink type thing. We, we put pretty much everything we get our hands on. Um, we even tried to get the UK Met uh, and their ensemble. They were a little reluctant to do that. So uh, we do have the European in there. Some of the resolutions are fairly coarse at this time. Uh, we're moving hopefully to more and more ensembles at closer to 25 kilometer resolution in the future, but we've got quite a few inputs in the 50 to 100 kilometer range, which obviously if you want to do an NDFD forecast at two and a half kilometers, uh, that can be problematic. So downscaling using ground truth such as IRMA, which is the unrestricted version of the RTMA and other data sets that are uh, at much higher resolution are is a critical component. We do run this every hour. Uh, the idea behind that is if some of the data sets arrive late, and we particularly see this with our, what we call data of opportunity, where you have other centers, because we have five different centers that contribute. NCEP is the biggest contributor, but we have Canada, we have BOM Australia, the ECMWF, and also Navy Finmark. That, and occasionally if something run is arrives late, it simply goes in the next hour and replaces uh, the, the, basically the latest guidance that available when it runs is in there. So we always have at least three inputs, things like the HER, the RAP, and gridded LAMP, uh, which is the localized aviation MOS product. They run every hour, so we always have a new input of those. But over time, the average change in inputs out of these 30, and some of these 30 are actually wave models for, for our significant wave heights that we have. Um, about seven new models come in every hour. We have 64 base elements. And the thing about this is it's act, it, it, we started off with a lot of deterministic products. That was our initial charter is the current NWS product suite is deterministic for the most part. Um, so we, you know, for better or for worse, we did 10 day forecasts, 264 hour forecasts for 64 elements. The, because of the probability thresholds and the percentiles that are growing by the year, there's far more than 64 total products. Uh, for example, a 24 hour QPF has a mean product and it has 99 percentiles and it has on the order of 10 threshold probabilities. So there's a lot of products involved in some of these. There are six domains at this point. Uh, we do expect to go global at some point, but this domain in the lower right at 10 kilometers is a fairly large domain, goes from roughly Australia to Western Europe. 
that was designed to serve some of the Pacific region offices and particularly uh, OPC, the, op the Ocean Prediction Center and the Hurricane Center's Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch, also known as TAF-B. Uh, but we have Guam, we've added Guam recently. And most of these are at roughly two and a half resolution. Alaska is a different uh, grid spec. So it's, uh, it's um, three kilometer and uh, Puerto Rico was already running at one and a quarter. So that's, we, I kind of cringe at going below two and a half kilometers because which we, we should probably keep the resolution fairly close to the resolution of our highest resolution models, which are around three kilometers. So going to one and a quarter is, you know, you can do it because of terrain maps, but I, you know, we've sort of tried to avoid that. So uh, a, ba a very quick and basic overview of what's happening with quantile mapping and dressing, mostly just what it produces. Again, I'll refer you to the expertise of Drs. Hamill and Shire of, of details. Uh, but a lot of our core elements use roughly 25 short-term inputs and maybe eight after 84 hours because of processing limitations on WCOS, we are generally taking ensemble means rather than the full membership to generate a deterministic forecast. The, uh, but with this, we're looking at all 171 short-term members that are available to us that drops off to roughly 115 members as you get out past 84 hours. And I'll show a chart later that shows the breakdown and the approximate weighting. Uh, a, sten a three by three stencil is used to increase uh, the, it's a synthetic increase of the value. So you get a lot more data. You also account for timing and position errors. Uh, um, but all of these are quantile mapped to the center point. And as you get to the tails of the distribution, uh, there's alternate regression that, that covers these uh, tail distributions that can get kind of unstable. And this shows that we don't run the quantile mapping every hour. It's run four times a day just because it's the processing is huge. Even doing every forecast hour out to 264 in parallel, it, it takes a lot of resources. Um, we're up around two or 300 nodes at peak on WCOS when we're turning the crank on this. Um, quite a few, again, we, we, we initially, we, we don't send all these percentiles out, but on nomads, we do produce every percentile from one to 99 of QPF six, 12 and 24. So, and then the mean values are also generated. Uh, so ideally you would want to use reforecast data over 20 or 30 years to best calibrate models to cover all kinds of extreme events so that your you know the tails of your distribution are more realistic and are, are you know are under dispersed given a small training set what what we could afford to do was a 60 day training period against the Irma, which is RFC QPE at this time. I, I would assume at some point we would use MRMS data as ground truth. But at this time, the QC RFC QPE, which is essentially a stage four with an effective resolution, the HRAP grid is somewhere around 4.7 kilometers. So it's, it's mapped to two and a half kilometers, but it's essentially and effectively a five kilometer resolution. 
the way we get more climatology data um, through, and again, here crossing the valley of death, um, our friends at OAR were able to help us do supplemental locations. So those use monthly climatologies based on 2002 to 2018, a combination, mostly CCPA, the climatologically calibrated precipitation analysis, also Seymour outside of that domain. What this map shows is just an example that at each grid point, for example, at Portland, Oregon, all these triangles indicate up to 50 locations that supplemental uh, data is used to train for this. So um, here's a location around Denver or Boulder. So the spread of you know where it can actually pick up data, training data, it has a lot to do with the slope of the terrain, the elevation, and, and many factors. So as rain, you know, and you think about it, if if you're in a dry period in Colorado and it hasn't rained in the last 60 days, uh, what what would you bias correct to when you finally get an event that's going to occur in Colorado? Well, maybe it maybe there were events that could be calibrated up in similar terrain over Montana and Wyoming where precip events did occur in the past 60 days that can be applied to it. Um, and, and obviously the overall climatology. Later I'll get, you know, I'll briefly mention that uh, we are on our way to replacing, at least for the GIFs, we will replace this technique with actual reforecast techniques. And that hopefully will happen in the next two to three years, depending on W Coast moratoriums and other items. So what does this look like? Just for example, um, in the first 36 hours, you have 171 inputs, but then as model systems drop out, and I hear we've got a question. So let's see what we've got oh, here. Sorry, Jeff, that was just me letting the folks know that came a little late, that they're welcome to put questions in the chat function. All right, well, no problem. So as it drops off past 84 hours, you lose the shorter range models. Uh, because this is equally weighted, the models with more ensemble members basically rule the school. So, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad idea given the verification, the European ensemble has about 30% of the weight in the short range and goes up to in the 40s after 84 hours, whereas most of the other ensemble systems like the GEFs and the GEPs have maybe 18% of the, if you add in their deterministic member. But again, that if you were to do some kind of verification-based dynamic weighting, I'm, you'd probably end up with fairly similar results, but we actually intend on doing that. But at this point, for the quantile mapping, it's all equally weighted. So the ensemble systems, which tend to be coarser, do dominate the distribution, uh, which, you know, for better or for worse. So Eric wants, you know, he's been, He's got a worn out copy of the ranked histogram work by by uh, Tom and, and all and Michael and wants to get that in there. Um, we were hoping for 4.0, but we ran out of time. So we're hoping to do that uh, in 4.1. And also at some point, uh, we are, uh, Tom has secured funding to work on using the gifts uh, 12, 20, I think about roughly 20 year reforecast data 
to replace the 60 day training sample for the CDF generation. And that we think that's going to be a really big deal. Um, but again, I'm just going to mention it at this point, not going to get into that because I want to show some, some examples uh, before so that we uh, can get through this. Um, we also, we had initially started with um, empirical distributions with PQPF and then a couple of versions ago, we generate, we went to a gamma distribution in cranking out the CDFs. We've now for 4.0, which should come out here this fall, we're using the same technique in QMD, except using a Gaussian distribution for CONUS, PROB, max T and PROB, min T. This, we started out with just the 60 day training period using Irma's two and a half kilometer ground truth. Uh, we don't have any supplemental locations or climatology information. It's just the models and the past 60 days of bias correction, essentially. So we do want to move towards using some kind of climatology going forward. Um, so I want to show you some example products from today. Um, this is a 24-hour forecast valid at 6Z uh, tonight. Uh, Texas under a moderate risk, I believe, for excessive rainfall. This is the mean QPF from the blend 4.0, which is the experimental version, which is in its 30-day test right now. Uh, so we're hoping for September 29th. It might be as late as mid-October. Hopefully we will get through the test clean. And here in Northeast Texas, uh, a mean value of 2.89. Uh, looking at the what we call the What's Up viewer, if you have a NOAA address, you can get into this. It's the whole story, uncertainty and probability viewer. It, Combine, there's been a lot of work to try to take some of the better viewers and show all the components. It's still a work in progress because a lot of our precipitation data for the models are embedded within the, the quantile mapping and dressing process. We don't have a lot of long term models to display, but it's something that's a work in progress. This is the operational. Uh, NBM at this at that point at the uh, this METAR and you can see this wide variety of inputs from less than an inch to over six inches uh, for that point not unusual you get wind roses based on the components uh, a violin plot which will eventually be a split violin plot with raw data on one side and bias corrected on the other But if you want to take a look at the threshold probability, so again, keeping in mind that the mean value is 2.8. Here's uh, the going from a tenth to quarter half, and then eventually one, two, three, four, five, six inch threshold probabilities. See so fairly high values, and the if you look closely up in the upper right, you'll see the threshold that it's. Um, showing, but some huge values of an inch or two, you know, well over 50%, and even at four inches, 10% chances up here, which I would consider a pretty big number. When you think about probabilities of rare events, like what SPC does with their uh, severe probabilities, you know, tw you know, 15 to 25% chance of a strong tornado is a pretty big number. So we start getting, these are pretty high numbers in my opinion. Uh, so a very interesting way to look at things rather than just the usual 2.9 inch mean value that we seem to like. With convection especially, it's almost nonsensical to put out a deterministic QPF forecast. So but that's just my opinion. So another example, uh, looks like it, you guys cooled off and may cool off again. Um, here's the blends deterministic 
min temperature forecast. You could think of it as a mean, but it's really a weighted mean. And it's got a boulder at 39 degrees. Uh, this is a, a week out. This is um, the morning of the 9th. So it'd be next Wednesday morning, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. You can see the impacts of bias correction to the urban I-25 corridor, most of the values above freezing, uh, much colder in the mountains, of course, as, as you normally would see. Um, wanted to show you the standard deviation of that forecast, though, from the inputs. And this is this being that it's beyond 84 hours, this is 115 inputs. So, and I'll just tell you that eight's a pretty big number. Numbers in the double digits, of course, are really big. But an eight degree standard deviation is a pretty big spread in the input. So lots of uncertainty. And again, uncertainty, not, I mean, on a, on a day seven or eight forecast involving potential of, you know, cold air, rocketing down the front range. I mean, high uncertainty, I think, would be a tip. You can see some values in the mountains of 12 or more. So we have dynamic weighting uh, in the national blend uh, for a lot of products. So whereas the QPF so far hasn't, we haven't done that, we'd, we'd like to, not a really a surprise here, here. If this is, this was just ran yesterday. This is at the grid point of the Denver airport and not exactly Boulder, but close. This is the dynamic weights. Um, and what it is, it's an inverse of the mean absolute error squared. So the, win the winners with the lowest mean absolute error over the period of the decaying average, which you know is heavily weighted in the past, 30 days, but does have a tail out to 60, 90 days. There's a little bit of a signal. Not a shocker that the European ensemble has the lowest mean absolute error, so therefore it has the highest weight, which in this case is around 11%. The GEFs, or the GEPs, the Canadian ensemble, is actually a close second. You see things are fairly clustered together. Even the Navy model has about an 8% weight. Um, Unfortunately, the GFS model is clearly not too good, has only a weight of 5%, much higher error. Uh, so if you, you know, with this in mind, and you look at the day seven forecast, you would think if you're run, you know, if you're running closer to the European ensemble, you're probably doing okay. Or the, the say the Canadian ensemble. So if someone wanted to be risky enough to try to lean, so again, if you look at the actual distributions of the min temperature in, uh, in Boulder, uh, and this is at the KBDU uh, site, you have a range of raw models, not, and again, raw models tend to be colder than reality in many cases, but, See, the operational blend has a low of about 39, as we saw. But the range of outputs go from a 26 from the European deterministic up to 39 for the Navy's ensemble mean. Uh, keeping in mind that the best performing models at that point recently, at least at the Denver point, now again, it, it'll be slightly different, but just for example, we're in the 32 to 34 range. So the European ensemble raw, and not the bias corrected one, but the raw one, 34 and 30. So, you know, if you wanted to roll the dice and having that information in hand, you might choose to pull down to say closer to freezing. Um, this is information that we haven't provided up to this point, but that we're hoping we can going forward to allow for uh, IDSS. And even if we don't change the number, at least messaging that there's a pretty good chance it could be uh, lower than that would be interesting. And 
what we can calculate, of course, um, is probability. So for this particular case, you've got a probability of around 18% of a freeze. Um, you know, the mean temperature 39, but, a, but a, you know, an 18% chance of freezing. And of course, because the hard freezes are the ones that there's non-zero chances of a hard freeze all through the metro, including the Denver airport, 5%. And of course, back in the mountains, um, some values well above 80%. Uh, do I have verification to validate all this? I don't at this point. It's something, you know, that we're hoping to work on. In fact, the, the our verification group at MDL has been working with the, the MET folks to, and I know that also CPC has been working with them to get a more robust probabilistic verification package so that we can really dig in and see what we've got for calibration. Um, so let, let's uh, quickly move forward here, show some more verification. Um, a little, little bit of, you know, comparison here. I was thinking about, you know, the, the, the NBM. I, we got a lot of complaints in 3.1 that the extended QPF was too, too heavy, too wet, uh, so too hot in this case. Um, our, some of the RFCs, River Forecast Center, said that it would often put their all their models into flood or all, all their basins. Uh, Tom Hamill warned me not to do this, but I ignored him. Um, I mixed in a lot more 50th percentile into 3.2 to reduce the wet bias and the extended. And it worked. It dropped. And now, now I'm getting complaints that it's too dry, too cold. So too hot, too cold, and I'm hoping 4 is just right. I went back. I I thought about Tom's comments. He he said, "I think you'll regret doing that," and uh, I did. So we're going to go back to just using the mean value from the CDF. So hopefully it'll be just right. What we've seen is this is the whole conus using the RFC QPE as verification. Uh, for and this is heavier categories. There's a lot of data, and I don't want to bore us with all of it. But the six-hour QPF and the CONUS from May through about a week ago uh, on, that occurred was forecast or observed in the one to three-inch category. So it's pretty heavy because it's not 24 hours; it's actually six-hour. The from 36 hours to 120, you can see the new 4.0 experimental nosing under all the others that are kind of clustered together. This has NDFD in blue, WPC in purple, the old blend in light red, and then the dark red, more brownish. So this is very encouraging. It seems it goes all the way across. The bias. These are fairly heavy amounts, but the bias, you know, you want to be up near zero. So it's clearly not as negative that as the much drier uh, 3.2, which is this lowest one. So you can see the other forecasts from official NDFD and WPC, much less of a dry bias. But you can see... And there is a little harmonic here caused by sample matching, but in general, not as much bias. So let's go back to more frequent categories. And this, to me, is the money slide. I'm just so pleased with these slides. Um, and again, a shout out to Tom for having clairvoyance that this would happen. But um, very, and this is a quarter to, I would call moderate and moderately heavy events, quarter to half inch in six hours. A huge improvement in bias where we're pretty much hugging the zero line from day two all the way out to day seven and still much better than operations. And even for a half an inch, I mean, we want obviously it'd be nice to be right along the zero line, but 
much, much less of a dry bias at these heavier amounts. So very pleased with that. And the resulting GSS is the same as equitable threat scores. Definitely a, a nice improvement for half inch and above, an inch and above, uh, fairly competitive, if not better. Again, it's very, because of timing, it's very hard to get good skill scores on six hour QPF because you can be right, be, be off six hours and, you know, with convection and other synoptic system, it's pretty easy beyond the first day or so to be off six hours. Uh, so let's, I'll try to push the envelope here. Calibration is very good. Courtesy WPC, this is PQPF. It's only one month, but this snapshot for all of these thresholds, uh, hundredth, quarter inch, inch, and two inches, and this is in 24 hours. Uh, pretty, pretty good calibration. Here's um, day one. Day two, a um, little bit on the dry side for two inches, but uh, awfully good calibration. Uh, here we go with uh, day three. Still, I mean, look at the one inch probabilities at these higher. I mean, it's very close to right along the 45 angle. And even at day, uh, you know, all the way out to day four pretty outstanding for one inch or greater events um i wanted to also do a little bit of a homer action here and i there's no obs official obs near here um i live three miles north of thermont on the blue ridge uh so here's dc down the bottom so i'm getting i'm a little closer to gettysburg than i am frederick about five miles from the border. Uh, zooming in on this grid point, two and a half kilometer grid point. There's my house in red or roughly. Um, I'm at 1,080 feet, but the grid point's actually 200 feet higher. So I would expect to be about one degree hotter in general than the grid points average if you know the grid we have a variety of from roughly six seven hundred feet up to seventeen hundred feet which of course in colorado that's just a little that's just a little ridge in someone's backyard or a molehill i i get that this is this is terrain out east in colorado this is just probably the elevation of some of your freeways above ground so i i get it i get it so but it's a big deal to us um, so I looked at forecasts for May, June, July, August at my house to compare to the actual and look at the frequency. So the frequencies of the forecast landing in that, in the whole nine day period within, you know, you would want pretty much to have close to, you know, distribution like this and looking at the percentages, you do see there's bias. Um, it is a cold bias. I didn't go back and look at Irma to see if the grid point is consistently a degree or two colder than my ob, which would make sense. But, you know, the above 90th is pretty well calibrated. Um, it's still, I think, giving pretty useful information. Uh, do I have calibration for the whole country? No. Um, so this was just sort of a... And again, I wanted to look at how these distributions fit. Um, there's definitely a cool bias where we we end up, you know, the temperature ends up higher in general than the 50th, so a little bit of cool bias. But the above 90th, pretty good. The 75th and above is not too bad. It's 31% versus what you would hope. And overall, it falls within the 10 to the 90th, 86% of the time, which you would want, again, about 80. So it's not bad. And again, this is not, there's no climo, and this is just cherry picking one spot, which isn't near a major METAR. So I, and I looked at PQPF at my house during the same period. It's a little harder because, again, 
I wasn't sure exactly what to do with all the zeros. So I only, I looked at non-zero uh, events where it was, there was QPF. And I also looked at any time there was at least a 50 pop or higher. So even if there was no precip, if it forecast above uh, 50%, then I went ahead and looked, you know, plotted them on here. And it's still encouraging to see that if you look between the 25th and the 75th, you get a lot of events. And, you know, I maybe the way I collected the data bias these lower, you know, and again, it, it's probably a statistical mistake on my, but I still was pleased to see this over a, a four month period. Um, again, it was above the 50th, 56% of the time and below the 50th, 44% of the time. So not too shabby. Uh, and I want to wrap it up. So we have a little time for questions. The development timeline, um, this we're in our 30 day test on day 12. The GEFs is also around day 19 of their 30 day test. We are pointing at GEFs version 12, which is the new upgrade. Therefore, if they fail their 30 day test, we automatically fail and have to restart. Long story short is we're not sure whether they will. GEFs has something that they think they would want to correct. However, if they have to correct, if they correct it in operate in, in the, in, on the during the parallel, the 30 day, they have to restart. And I'm not sure if they will or not. So if nothing changes, we're on for September 29th, we hope. If GEFs, decides to change their aerosol um, part of the uh, of, of the model, then they will have to restart and we would too. But anyhow, um, one last thing, and we talked about this, um, we'd like to do ranked histogram for PQPF in the future and add climatology to our max the men suite. We also want to do probabilistic wind and wind gusts in the next upgrade. But the next upgrade is probably going to be at least two years from now because of the moratorium on WCOS. And again, I appreciate your attention. There's quite a few links on here. Uh, you, for the most part, need a NOAA email to get to them uh, they're behind firewalls but if anyone wants some of the information particularly these uh, documentation i can whip up a pdf and send it to you more than likely uh, thank you very much oh. <laughs> yeah vir virtual applause jeff thank thank you very much so we do have um you left us lots of time for questions, um, so let's open it up to questions. I think maybe the easiest is just to continue. Well, not continue. Nobody's posted a question yet, but put a question in the chat, and then we can just take them in the order they come. And I'd be, again, happy to put slides back up to discuss any questions, but I'll, for now, I'll just go ahead and leave it down. Hey, Jeff, since since I've got the floor at the moment and people are probably still contemplating, um, let me throw you a softball. Um, They're probably reaching for caffeine or they've, they've uh, <laughs> I've given a give, given good a after, after, after lunch <laughs> nap. <laughs> Anyways, Tim, go ahead. Yeah, so you'd mentioned um, you were using the, the 60 days to do the past 60 days to do the bias adjustment. Is that is that like an on the fly rolling bias correction? Yeah, it's a it's an exponentially weighted decaying average. We we started out using an alpha 
of 0.05. Uh, EMC uses, for their NAVES bias correction, uses 0 0.02. 0 0.05, of course, means that the first day is 5% of the signal and then, of course, drops off. Uh, we found that in the summertime, that alpha is not too bad, an alpha of 0 0.05. But 0 .0, what we've done starting in 3.2 is we changed the alpha to 0 0.025 in the other nine months so that the signal, you know, it doesn't, it's not as erratic with short range pattern changes. What we, you know, in the summertime, you can get away with it, particularly with temperature, but in the winter, pattern changes make the 0 0.05 bias correction, um, it, it doesn't do as well. And we found it does better. And Bob Glon had done some studies uh, here that showing that the 0 0.025 alpha setting was better. And uh, then it had a longer tail to it and it wasn't so heavily weighted with the past 10 to 20 days. Cool, and, and it looks like we have some, uh, thanks for answering that one, Jeff. It looks like some questions are coming in the chat. So um, we'll go Brian Cosgrove, and then after Brian, Tom Hamill. Go ahead, Brian. So Brian says, what is the temporal resolution of the QPE and temperature of which of the NBM 4.0 outputs. So we have temperature that is hourly, and again, not probabilistic. The deterministic temperature is hourly through 36 hours, and then it's three hourly through roughly 192 hours, and then it's six hourly after that. Uh, the QPE, we, we actually do a deterministic QPE, uh, one hour QPE out to 264 hours. Um, it's based on, the, in the first 36 hours, it is basic, it is mostly a expert weighted blend of high resolution models with a little bit of the QMD thrown in. Um, the after 36 hours, we take the quantile mapped six hour QPE or QPF. I'm sorry, you said QP. The, the QPF forecasts are we use a fractional comparison to climatology. So we looked at the hourly uh, climatology compared to the six hour about climatology and came up with fractional so we can take disaggregate the six hour calibrated QPF into one hour blocks using that roughly um, 16 or 17 year climatology. Uh, it's not ideal, but it, you know, and eventually we want to do quantile mapped uh, one hour probabilities. We're just not sure how much resources that's going to take. Um, hopefully that answered um, your question, Brian. So let's see. And Tom's right. I was the the exponentially weighted decaying average applies to maximum temperature, temperature dew point, wind speed, um, sky cover now but we, we don't do that for any of the preset products. Let's see, Andy Wood. Um, I'd love to benchmark the NBM versus the European. Uh, haven't done that yet. Um, but Tom, what Tom Hamill has shown in comparing just the European ensemble to the Canadian ensemble and the GEFs is that it, you know, 
this uh, it, it you can imp you can drastically improve the GIFs or the Canadian by using it together, but then the the European it's tough to beat it. You can add, add a tiny bit of value, but it, at times it, it's a much it's a much lower uh, improvement in value. And so again, Tom has done a lot of work with that, and I think he hinted at that. But you. you we're not adding a lot to the European and the extended, but in the short term, I would say because we're using a hundred kilometer resolution version of it, we don't have access to the native resolution. Uh, we're, we're very happy to have access to the course resolution. Let's just put it that way. And that that's a long story. I don't have time to get into, but um. And it looks like Andy and Tom have interacted about all that. So I apologize. I should have just read that. Thank you, Tom, for – I knew it would be good to have Tom uh, uh, cleaning up the mess uh, along the way. <laughs> <laughs> And Michael's been quiet, but he's – Michael Shire has spent a lot of time helping uh, the direct feedback that we've gotten about the – especially the resolution of the products out west, which, again, it's very challenging to downscale 50 or 100-kilometer ensembles to make it – make forecasters happy that look at a deterministic forecast from a model – and say, why can't it look like that? Well, probabilistic forecasts include a lot of uncertainty. If you don't know which way the wind's direction is blowing in day seven, what, you know, what you're going to forecast in Colorado mountains is going to vary a lot based on wind direction. And we're not always sure about the synoptic pattern. So it's, you know, it's easy to make a very sexy looking high resolution QPF forecast, but it doesn't mean it's any good. So we get a, there's, there's a lot of adjustment from forecasters that really are expecting a lot more resolution and they seem happy with it, even if they know it's probably wrong. And the, the whole, you know, the quantile mapping is done to minimize error and, and increase skill. And so it's just not, it's never going to look like a her forecast. And I think that's what they really want to see. Jeff, Tom Hamill here. Could I sort of um, amplify your remarks there? So the approach that we developed to this quantile mapping is kind of assuming that today's weather is a draw from the same distribution that was used to populate the cumulative distribution functions. Um, and in the transition seasons, and we're headed into one now, we have a situation, let's say we're at a day in early October, and the training data reflects the previous two months, August and September. Well, uh, for a lot of parts of the United States, they've been experiencing convective precipitation and we're making a transition into more of a cool season precipitation regime. So the approach that underpins the current national blend of using the last 60 days of training data really has some significant issues uh, in these transition seasons. And this is where my colleague Michael Schurer has done a lot of work Regrettably, um, we haven't gotten it published yet, but um, you know, trying to figure out what the heck can you do in, in this really challenging situation of trying to exploit the value of a short training data set. Yeah, and that was mostly, we're only allowed to draw from training data sets that reside on WCOS. And so, the 60 day budget was mainly of, you know, that's what we could afford. And we'd love to be able to find ways to save, say last, when we're going into December, if we have last year's December 
in advance or some series of maybe the last 20 Decembers, <laughs> it would be fantastic for us to do that rather than depending in November on what happened in September and October. That's, that's really our, you know, drawback, but it, it's, it's worked relatively well despite that. I mean, it's, 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 I think it's quite good and, but I think it can definitely get better. I have to ask you, Jeff, if you and Tom are coordinating your messages, Tom's got a bear on his shirt and you have Goldilocks and the three bears in your talk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, mine's, I, mine's a skeptical bear. Yeah. I think, I think the, you know, I know people get, can think it's sometimes corny to talk about diversity, but I think having, you know, operational and academic folks and statistical experts and forecast is in modelers involved in this. And there's just too many people to really name. Over a hundred people have made pretty big contributions to the blend. Um, but it's it's really neat to have the interaction of how how things verify versus how they're used. Um, I found that we can show verification to forecasters that clearly says we're doing better, but there's skepticism about the verification or the verification doesn't represent truly what I'm getting at. And as we go more into IDSS, I think that continues to become more important is if we, you know, we can come up with all the metrics we want, but sometimes there's just this forecaster giggle test where you stick it in front of them and it's either useful to them or it isn't. Um, the other issue is forecasters, I think, have, and I was a forecaster for many years, so I can say it, forecasters have a very high opinion of themselves, even if it's not deserved, I, which is, I'm sure, drives modelers crazy. Because, you know, they, they look at their model, it did really well with the squall line, and then they look at the local forecast and they wonder, well, what's going on? So I, I see, I've see i seen both sides of it. <laughs> yeah, um, that, that's, I think, one of the great things about the position you're in, uh, Jeff, is, is, you know, where it's coming from and... Um, the fact that you embrace the, the research community. I, um, we are um, at the end of our hour here. Um, I mean, if folks want to, Jeff, it's it's late for you, your East Coast. Um, I'm, I'm happy to stay on if, if folks want to discuss more. Uh, it's, it's fine, How, however you want to. And again, I'm just an email away uh, and Obviously, Tom is there in Boulder, and you know Phil. Is, you know Tom has intimate, and Michael have intimate knowledge of of what's going on in the QMD. Um, so, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm very excited that the National Water Model folks are at least considering. One thing I I showed them that I didn't show here are comparisons to the GFS. Um, I just I would just love for them to switch off of the GFS to the blend because I I think using it I mean I know why they're using a deterministic model but if they can go over the blend I think the performance is going to be much better they're going to have a much lower FAR for the higher end events uh, I, I'm I'm very excited that they will consider that. I hope not sure what time frame because implementations are really tough. I think they have one coming up soon, so they, they wouldn't be able to do it for a few years. But I'm I'm looking forward to hopefully that happening very soon. Yeah, I, Jeff, the, Tim, again, I I obviously cannot speak for anyone in NOAA uh, anymore, at least. Um, but just I know in conversations with Tom Graziano and and Ed that um, you know they were impressed with the the progress made and were interested. I I don't want to put anybody at the water center on the spot. I, I see Fred's.
picture is still here. I don't know if Fred has any well, that, thoughts. That, that's fine. I, I'm just glad we had the conversation, yeah. and I'm I'm hoping that it I'm hoping it works out. But you know, it's you know, there's practical considerations too, and there's timing things, and and I you know I I don't completely understand all the you know the pressures they have to to keep it running but hopefully it's something that can be done at some point yeah certainly certainly the dialogue helps and I I know um, everybody gets busy so it was really great um, just to get an update from you on on where you're at and where you're heading and it sounds like some great things are in the works I I did um, since we're there's still some of us on if others have questions uh, please jump in, but I was a little bit curious about, um, and maybe we can just go a few more minutes. Um, just, it, can you say any more about some of the work you're doing with the MET folks? That That's intriguing. Obviously, MET is a homegrown package here. Um, so, I'm sorry, the, the question about MET is, I, I, I don't think I, Captured what you were looking for. Oh no! You just mentioned that your your assessment work. You're you're interacting with some of the Met folks in DTC. Right, and the, some of those graphics were generated in our QPF verification system using Met. So the root mean square error, the bias, the uh, Garrity skill scores were that we Dana Strom and Dave Roos group has worked with the Met folks to convert, they're, they're working to convert all our verification software at MDL to using Met Plus. Um, so we're thinking of the big picture of this, you know, community modeling with community post-processing with community verification. And so we're we're moving in that direction. And so, yeah, some of the some of those images were harnessed from Met, and w there's there's quite a bit of work going on. I know to to go from deterministic to probabilistic verification, and I, I know that'll come along. And we desperately need it because um, <laughs> I have a little bit of it, but it's sort of out of hide and chaotic and we'd really love to be able to have a you know it in met plus where we're, everybody is familiar with the uh, platform and can manipulate the data in the same way i'll just i'll put it out there that there's a new jtti call so there could be potentially if you wanted to reach out to jeff and talk to him maybe some opportunities to advance things there collab collaboratively um i Jeff, I see Andy had asked a question in the chat. Andy, do you want to just jump on? And Andy, the the answer is that there's still, <laughs> I think the Northwest RFC in Portland is using the blend QPF. A lot of RFCs are using blend temperature information, but uh, another, the other RFCs are mainly using either WPC QPF as a starting point and then adjusting or coming up with their own QPF, which is something obviously we're trying to have one QPF in the weather service that, you know, and my idea was that would be the blend, but, um, and then we would go from there. And it's particularly for RFCs, you know, it's Dane. I know we've had a history of doing deterministic QPF that gets deterministic river forecasts, but really the calibrated probability spectrum, which would drive the probabilistic river stages and impacts, is to me is the future. And, you know, I really think we're in a position already for them to do that whether or not they will. Most of the applications I hear about are using GIFs for, you know, probabilistic hydrological forecast. I'd like to see, you know, the blend instead of that. But again, I, I don't, 
as a developer, you know, I'm not supposed to go out and solicit, you know, I, I do a little solicitation of, hey, maybe you should try this. But at this point, it's the results are mixed. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I asked because um, I was at, RF, at the RFC back in 2012. And um, I think we were starting to try to pull the console blend through AWIPS and look at it for forecasting. That was like, you know, the precursor to all of this. And um, it seemed like there was a lot of enthusiasm. So I'm just kind of wondering if that spread and continued to like build out into the uh, RFC world or not. There's, um, yeah, I, it depends. The answer is it depends, but yeah, Portland has been, a big fan. I think the others often consult the data, but not necessarily use it to drive their, uh, that I think that whole connection with science and operations and Boulder was you know, important. So I wanted to, I was a little selfish. I wanted to give the talk. So <laughs> it's good to see many of your smiling faces. Um, so thank you. And, uh, Appreciate the invite. Yeah, no, no, it, it was great, Jeff. We appreciate it, and and I think it, it's good to have, you know, if researchers only ever talk to researchers and and operations only. Talk